second in our series on beginner seed saving. Um, they were looking at bean seed saving um, as part of the community grow out program for the Bauta Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security's uh, Atlantic region programming. Uh, and we're joined today by uh, Tegan Wong Doherty. That's how you say the name? Great. Doherty. Um, Doherty, great. Um, from uh, Knowlesville, New Brunswick, um, who's going to be sharing uh, a little bit of her experience with um, saving beans. Um, and yeah, looking forward to having uh, a good discussion about it. Um, so Tegan, I'll pass it to you. That's great. Thank you so much, Caitlin. And, um... Yeah, beans are a pretty fun thing to save um, and they're not too complicated. Um, so I think it's a really wonderful, even for people that just wanna embark on seed saving, it's probably the one that I would recommend the most because they are fun, they're beautiful and um, really rewarding. So Samuel, have you, just tell me a little bit about if we can just know what some of your experiences gardening and what you would like to get out of the, the webinar since I can tailor it to different levels, right? Yeah, so uh, I'm with the Park and Pine. It's a collective garden in Moncton. So we're actually a garden, not as opposed to a community garden. We're like the, the, the place where everyone has the same lot. Okay. So we, uh, we, have, um, we have one lot with, uh, it's a double lot with, um, several beds so there's like a productive uh, it's like permaculture arranged so there's a zone one is for uh, the kitchen garden that's where we seed save so, so we keep uh, squash and beans and like uh, parsley and and dill and stuff like that this year and then um, bed two uh, zone two is for the the productive part like uh, where we all do the vegetables and we also have like a food forest so we have different uh, plants over there and um, yeah, so we have uh, we have this garden where we save seed, but everyone is invited to participate and save seed themselves, or if they want to, if they want to learn about it. So I'm gonna keep pass this along information along to whoever's uh, interested. Great. Well, that sounds wonderful. And um, I have a little presentation with some photos and stuff, um, and then. Really, I'll open up to any kind of questions that you have at the end, or you can stop me at any time throughout the thing if you like. Oh, that makes me think of a question. So just go for it. And same thing with you, Caitlin, if you want to jump in at any time, just do it. So I'm gonna to try to do the share screen thing. Oh, you have to enable me, it says. Does oh, that, yeah. you guys can see that? Yes. Okay. That looks so, great. My other life is as a forest school teacher. And so this is actually not a great tip. This picture is actually from us just growing beans probably in February or something. So there's still snow outside, but I just put it at my front page because um, we're gonna be focusing on, on beans. So, and this is the considerations that I thought would be good for us to look at is just variety selection, some planting tips, isolation distances and population size. Also just general growing, roguing, harvesting um, experience. And then the whole process of drying off, both on the vine after harvest and then selection. So those are the things I'm gonna cover in my talk. And then definitely if there's anything else that comes up that we can, we can jump into that. I've been growing beans for probably, hmm, it's probably 20 years or so now. <laughs> Partly because I just loved how beautiful they were, how they feel in your hand, everything. I like eating beans. I think they're great protein. So this is actually a picture of last year's harvest um, of the Bay Vert um, variety uh, that we grew out for about a seed initiative. And they were just beautiful. Um, it was a great year for drying. We had a really dry year, but they still did well. Um, they had enough moisture to, um, to size up, um, but then they also had a nice drying time to really dry down. So I was really happy with them. So when I'm looking at sort of variety selection, you know, I'm looking for open pollinated because then I can save the seed um, and heritage heirlooms just means that it's been around for long enough to have the genetics to be stable um, as an open pollinated variety. I also sort of look and see if it's suited for my growing area. Like, is it a short season variety? Like how 
long. So you can have like green beans that are great for eating that will, will mature enough in a season, but sometimes they don't have enough time to dry off. So those are sort of some of the considerations. And I always think if I can get my seed source as close as possible to where I am gardening, that's sort of the best option. So that's why I really love the um, Atlantic seed project is it's trying to try out these varieties or, you know, bring them back into cultivation uh, varieties that have been suited for this area. And by growing them in this area too, you're selecting the ones that were successful in maybe a shorter, maybe more a maritime growing region, all these things that um, make the seed sort of more robust for your area. Obviously, I mean, beans have a wide range of, they're, they're so versatile, like they come from the Americas. So they're um, the indigenous uh, food crop um, and developed here. So they can grow really all the way from zone 11 to zone three. They're very versatile, but still the, the quality of the individuals that were selected for that maybe are grown in California you know, might have different quality selections and pressures than something that was grown um, in the maritime. So I like to support um, buying or getting seeds, sharing seeds from people that are growing right around me because that means that they probably already were successful in this area. There's also um, sort of a distinction between pole and bush varieties. I, I grow both. Pole, you have to put up some kind of trellising. So that might add a little bit of, um, a challenge in some areas, but um, they're lovely and they tend to be a little bit more um, less disease uh, prone. I mean, I don't have a lot of problem with disease if you're rotating and you're keeping a healthy soil environment. Um, beans are not prone to diseases in general, but um, I think it's just the airflow aspect of a pole bean because it gets up off the ground that gives it that extra protection from mildew and things like that, that if you have a very wet year, that's the only thing that I've ever struggled with as a bush bean um, is that sometimes they get wet um, and it's hard for them to dry up. Um, and then the other, which is my favorite reason to pick a variety is just, you think it's beautiful. It has some kind of local significance or it maybe has just a really great story. So the next, I, I have a friend who um, loves beans just as much as I do and she has, selected out, you know, certain beans that she's telling stories of, of where they've come from. These are all indigenous beans. And um, just to give you an example, this is the story of the skunk bean and I have them right here. I grew out, I was given a little handful of them and they're just beautiful. They do look like little skunks because they have a little, <laughs> they have a little stripe on them. It's like a little skunk stripe. And they're a amazingly vigorous pole bean uh, that was a traditional, that is a traditional bean of the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois nation and were traded. So it went from there, but also went all over the six nations. Um, and it's just kind of neat because each bean is also a little variable. So you can have, um, you know, a black bean that has white patterning on it, but you can have a white bean that has a black patterning on it. And apparently you can also have beans that are all the way white. I, those are very rare but, and I haven't found them, um, but I've had some that were edging towards white with just a few dots, for example. So it just shows that even within a, a population um, that there's, there's the connection to probably their parent type is still present, which is great for genetics. So just sharing. Sometimes the selection is purely heart and I think that's okay. Um, in uh, planting sort of tips, I mean, beans do like warm soil. Um, around here, I was reading some history from the uh, Willistiquay First Nation and some of the planting uh, practices and often beans were planted later, um, but they were planted on interval soil that was after floodwaters sort of receded, it was just naturally clear and it it would be then after like the ice had flowed out. So it's just that timing of the soil is warm enough that it's not gonna rot your seeds. And for me where I have, you know, at best a 90 day 
growing season. So it's very, it's quite short. We can have uh, a frost. Last year we had a frost in July, which was awful. Um, but we can have a frost as early again in September. So the timing is really, I often will try to push and see if I can get things in and then make sure I don't use all my seed. And then if I have to replant, I replant. So when I said planting for emergence after the last frost, Sometimes you can get away with planting a little bit if you've got good conditions, the soil has warmed up a bit and you can even help the soil warm up by putting black plastic down. Um, but you can, uh, you can plant even be, if there isn't a, a, a frost after you've planted, it's not the end of the world, it's after emergence. So it generally I, I give myself, if I know the last frost is the last full moon in June, it's usually the, the um, local way of thinking about it, and it's often right. Um, I might plant just a few days before the full moon, just to get them in the ground as fast as I can, and then hope that there won't be a frost. And I've I've had to cover sometimes because I've they've come up and there has been a frost. But you can put also row cover over. It's just a, a bit of a pain if you have a bigger a bigger garden. <laughs> um, the other thing that I've used sometimes is inoculant um, that you can get um, organic inoculant of the ribosomium, and that's good for all legumes. And I only do that really if it's a fairly new garden or if there's no evidence of clover around. Um, I just want to make sure that because it's in the legume family, that really helps in its overall health and productivity to, to have those, um, those great bacteria that help convert you know, nitrogen into usable uh, plant food. So um, it's one of the magics that legumes can do. And if you're doubtful that your soil has some rhizomium, all you have to do is pull up a legume. So that could be vetch, that could be, um, that could be clover. And um, you can just look at the roots. And I even have, I'll show you guys this later, but this is like, they look really like little, you know what they are like, little balloons of, of activity that are in there. Um, and that just means they're present and, um, and that's great for the bean and it's great for your soil as well. So, so if you don't have, if you're feeling like it, that your garden space needs that, you can get a little package often at seed supply stores and it's just a powder and you just shake your seeds sort of like a shake and bake chicken thing, but it's for your beans. And you just shake it on your seeds before you plant it and it coats it. And then you just plant the seeds. So it's, it's super easy to do. And I haven't seen anything that was GMO or anything, but that would be something I'm always watching for that the inoculant is organic and um, so that there's nothing um, being put in that I'm not wanting in my organic beds. So. Um, and then basically the spacing is what you're looking for is just enough space for it to get light, right? So this is a great picture where it's showing both, there's some bush beans in the foreground and then back at the back, that's some pole beans that already are starting to climb, but they want, you wanna have enough space so that they can kind of get light on them and airflow, but not so much that you're gonna to have to be, you want, beans are absolutely fantastic at shading the soil themselves um, because they just come up fast and they're, they're nice and bushy, have great, leaves. So it's nice to know that they can actually self shade their soil as well. And that keeps down some of your, your, your weeding pressures. Um, and, uh, and then, so yeah, three to four inches, one inch deep. I usually just think of my finger as being my, my first knuckle on my finger, as long as if I'm poking them down and that's, that's perfect. Um, and then I water, I tend to not soak my beans unless I'm really not as sure about their germination. And the reason why is that if you soak them and then you don't get any rain for a long, for a while, then the ground around them actually almost dries them out again. And so they can have that sort of wetness and then dry out, um, which isn't the best for them. Um, but if, if I'm a little bit worried because they're older seed, I might soak them, you know, for three or four hours just to get them going. And then I'll plant them when I know that there's rain coming right away. And that can just be beneficial sometimes. 
And mulch is great, like a light mulching also just keeps down the weeds and the weeds, you know, can take away, yes, the fertility and the space, but mostly it's also airflow. Um, my biggest problem with beans on a wet year is just making sure that they don't get like a, a white mildew because they're too, uh, they're not getting the sunlight and the airflow. And so that if you've got crowding in of weeds, it can really be a problem for them. And then I always make a pl plug for raised beds and mounds. Um, because beans do like good drainage and it can also by being a bit higher it's above the uh, the grasses around I mean this person's garden this isn't one of my photos it's way too neat um, <laughs> you know they've kept the the grass mowed around but if your your grass is growing around it sort of gets them around a little bit higher and you know one technique you can do to make like a mound is hookah culture I don't know if, if anyone's heard about this but it's just really making a growing area out of um, wood debris that over time rots down um, and we did it to make just some like a very fast bed on a, a gravel driveway um, and I'll just show you and really we just made a little a structure we put in some cardboard where there was some grass growing down and we just filled it all in with with a bunch of woody de debris that we that was starting to rot already that we just said, oh, well, we can have a place where it's doing some good for making a garden. And it was really part of a, it was how to make an instant garden on a place that hadn't been a garden. It was a driveway or parking lot. So there it is at the end and uh, ready to plant. So that's just a, a quick little easy, you can look it up, hookah culture is the German word, but it's a, a nice way to make a raised bed. That's very cool. But back to beans. So this is me a couple of years ago um, in our seed garden. And we were growing, I think that year, um, orca beans. And um, there's no other gardens around for at least 50 meters. Um, and so it makes it a great place for just growing out some seeds and having the isolation distances. But beans are really forgiving. Um, beans are don't actually, they're self fertile. And so, one of the things that I go to is the Seeds of Diversity handbook on whenever I'm planting anything for seeds and I want to just check, you know, what they recommend for, for, um, for isolation distances. So for bush and pole beans, which are self fertile, they really are just looking at three meters or that'd be about nine feet um, distance for community scale. So that's you're sharing with your friends, you're not um, you're not putting it in a seed library or, or sort of putting it in a place where, you know, people don't know that you're just doing your own kind of seed saving. And then you just double those distances if you're going to do it for that larger scale or for the seed bank, for example. I think that you guys like to have the commercial scale sort of um, considerations. And mm -hmm. with, with that, the minimum plant, plant population is 20 for the community scale or family saving or, um, or 40 per commercial scale. And I always do a little bit more because you're gonna lose some plants, you're gonna rogue out, it's not all your plantings, not every seed's gonna germinate. So I always sort of look at if I have the space, I might as well even double that. And then I've got a really good um, chance to, to grow out. But 50, you know, 50 is a probably a good uh, ballpark for commercial scale um, as a minimum. And then it gives you some space for roguing if you need to. And do you do you use it? Does the Bauda Seed Initiative also have like a seed guide or, or do you recommend seeds of diversities as? I think I've mostly seen people recommend this guide. Um, yeah, a really popular one. Yeah, And I, it's not mm. super expensive. You can get it online and um, I I, I like it. It goes through the whole process of a bunch of different families. So mm -hmm. uh, great. we have a few crop specific um, guides and resources in our resource library, but I think this is a great all around one. So when we're looking at roguing and harvesting for eating, um, I'm just really looking for unhealthy plants. So if there's some yellowing, some sign of like anything being a little bit off. I might also see some, like if it was supposed to be a bush variety and I'm seeing some characteristics that looks like tendrils and I'm saving it for the seed bank, <laughs> 
I would probably rogue those out because that's not what it said it was supposed to be. So that's something that um, I'll look out for is just sort of characteristics that are are not in line with what we're we're trying to say. But if I was doing it for myself, I'm often really curious to see, you know, what what happens with the with those ones that are are looking a little like pole beans. Um, and then also food, like, uh, well, airflow, sometimes, you know, you plant a little bit more thickly, maybe everything germinated and you had planted sort of with the idea that um, not every single seed would would, um, would sprout. So you can also just thin out a little bit just to give you the right kind of feeling of overall space and air uh, for the plants. Um, and if you have to, pull out like a healthy plant. I did one by accident. I was just in my bead bed yesterday. So I will show this when we turn off the, the, um, the video or the presentation part, but it's actually kind of a neat opportunity to then look at the roots, which you don't normally get a chance to look at when it's above ground. Um, and then for, you know, ones that actually do have an eating stage that's sort of at a fresh eating stage, I really encourage people to eat their beans. Like I remember when I first started planting beans um, just cause I loved how they looked. And a lot of them are dry beans. So the finished stage is the dry bean but some of them were just wax beans and or they had a snap stage. I was just like, oh, I wanna save them all for seed, right? And so I never tried any. And then people would ask me, oh, have you ever eaten them? And I'm like, no, I haven't. <laughs> So I encourage people to actually eat them. I do eat mine now. I even eat my dry beans. I used to save them all the time because I wanted to save them for seed. And then I started eating them and they're the best, like homegrown beans. I think because they're fresh. They're, they're just much more, mm, like they're so good. They're, they cook faster and they're usually more tender. Um, so I really love homegrown beans. Um, and then for the wax and snap stage beans, you just really get them when they're just at that stage that the beans are all like if it's a snap bean, like green inside or white, and they're nice to eat and you can just enjoy them. And there's actual benefits for your seed saving endeavors because if you have 50 plants, that's a lot of beans if you just leave them all on the vine, right? And you won't need that much, um, even if you're sharing with all your aunts and uncles and friends and like that's going to make a lot of beans. So if you're doing a wax bean in particular where you don't really eat the bean for its dry bean stage, I say, you know, leave five to seven beans per plant. And the nice thing is you still have the population um, benefit of a whole bunch of plants that you're harvesting from. But by harvesting, they're also gonna create better conditions for those remaining bean pods to fully develop and fill out because they're not trying to keep producing um, more beans. And the other benefit just on the harvest and eating side is at least for bush beans, as soon as your first bean starts going to seed, it ends the production for the rest of your plant. Um, and it starts to slow down. So by actually harvesting and just leaving a few to go to seed, um, you'll actually have a long, longer harvest season that you can actually eat your, your beans from. So that's really the benefit. It, and you can, if you're saving for something bigger like a seed library and you know you can save, you know, seven to 10 beans per plant. Like it depends what quantity you're trying to get at the end. Um, or if you're doing dry beans, then of course you're gonna leave a lot more Per plant but I was just but the ones that you're really getting the benefit for food most from the wax or the snap stage I would say enjoy and um, don't worry you'll have lots of beans at the end of the season. For pole beans I've found and I'm not sure I, I'm kind of like if this was just my experience but I feel like they fruit from bottom to top and and they definitely have a longer season and it just makes sense that the first flowers come as the plant's growing and then it just keeps flowering up and so I usually start harvesting the lower beans as soon as they're dry. And that's actually because there's a problem if you have some beans that have already dried down a fair bit and then they get a big rainstorm is they can actually start to mold or they can start to take on and start swelling and, and beginning sprouting, which in both cases makes them not ideal for saving for seed. 
we'll go on and I'm almost done here. Two more slides. This is again the bay vert. So ideally when I'm harvesting the dry pods, they snap, like they're hard and crisp and they won't be like, you won't be able to wiggle them. They're really their own um, hard, crisp um, item. And I won't, I, I'm, I'm a gardener that doesn't do a lot of the shelling of the beans until way into the winter. So I just harvest all the beans, put them in a nice basket, cardboard boxes. These ones were actually put in a banana box because it had that nice um, sort of paper that had holes in it. And it felt like it had a nice, you just want something that will let air flow through it. And then once I was done with all my various chores in the garden, you know, this is a great winter chore of actually starting to shell them. And that has the added benefit of, you know, that they've been really, they've dried down enough. Um, if you were anxious and you were like, I want to harvest them now, I want to put them into storage, maybe you have a mouse problem, so you're worried about them. Still, you want to wait until, so the pods should be crisp. And then when you open them up, there's another drying period of at least you know, two weeks. And that just makes sure that any ambient moisture that's around the seed also just evaporates off. And before you put it in storage, that might be airtight and stuff, because you don't want to have any storage, you don't want to have any moisture left in, in them um, before you put them into storage. And you don't have to put them in an airtight, they could be put in a, in a bag that still allowed some airflow. But I, I do put like, I'll put my beans in in mason jars and it just means that they're protected. Um, sometimes we'll add in a little bit of silica. Um, let's see what this has in it. It has a little pouch. So if you've ever eaten like those instant noodles, they have little pouches usually in them to keep them dry. Um, I don't know if you can reuse those, but you can get from seed supply stores little silica beads. And they, the neat thing about them is that they will, they're completely reusable. So you can have a nice muslin little sack and put, you know, maybe a tablespoon in with your bead, beans. And it just makes sure that any moisture sort of will get absorbed into this rather than going into your bean and sort of breaking the, the dormancy of them. Um, and to just, like if I ever, these ones have turned a little bit like a lilac color and when they're really dry, they're actually blue. Um, so I can actually make these drier again by just putting them on a cookie sheet and drying them at the low, a low end of an oven and um, they'll dry out again. And then I can reuse them. I, I just noticed that, oh, they're a little pinkish. So when they go pinkish, that means they've done their job and they've taken away moisture, but they're not taking any more <laughs> moisture out. And I think this is it. Um, oh, well, just in terms of the Bay Bear Indian bean, it is uh, a bean that was grown in the maritime area by First Nations. Um, and I wasn't able to find its specific story uh, per se, um, but uh, I, we've, we grew it last year as part of the Bauta Seed Initiative and um, we're given the seeds from a Quebec seed company called, uh, I think it's at the bottom there. I can't see it because I've got a little thing over it, but um, potage ornamental or something like this. And it used to be grown by a maritime company that was called uh, Hope Seeds and Perennials. Um, I know they had it uh, when Kim Evanston was running the company. And I, I'd, I'd like to see what hers, cause she often would document the stories, but I wasn't able to online when I was preparing for this to find you know, a longer story of its history in the Maritimes. Um, it was very sort of generic. So I'm gonna try to find some more information, but it is considered semi grimpant from the potage um, company. And, um, and it really was, it was like full on pole bean for me and needed support and ripened really nicely from bottom to top. And I harvested several times in the seasons when, as soon as the, the pods were dry. Um, and we ended up, because we had lots of seeds, we, we sent some to, for the Toro Seed Bank, but we also sent some to the to, two local seed libraries. And one of the, uh, some elders from the seed library in Woodstock, New Brunswick said, oh, 
I remember um, eating uh, Bay Verte as a great baked bean. So she remembered growing it back, you know, 20 years ago. She's like, I haven't seen this in a long time. So she was really thankful that it was just free and available for growing at the, at the seed library. So, and it is, we've, we've uh, used it too. And it's really nice um, tasting bean and soups and all sorts of things. So that's all I have. I'm gonna stop my share here. And if you have any questions. That's lovely, thank you so much. Okay. Oh. That representation I really learned a lot. I'm a beginner at gardening, so I'm really uh, not so uh, not so cognizant of the different uh, steps to seed save, especially. But I know how to grow vegetables, but like seed saving is really new for me, so it's great to uh, to really uh, really know about it. Mm -hmm. Well, beans are a great one, and I just, I just want to show you this. It's kind of neat because this is a a bean plant. This is um, actually a blue jay. It's a wax bean. So you're seeing the little beans are already starting on it. Um, and actually we've already done our harvest. It's a beautiful wax bean. I like it. But you can see the, the roots. You can see those nodules. I didn't get the full root. Most of it stayed in the, the ground, but just even the presence of, you know, one or two nodules says, hey, it's in the soil. So I have nothing to worry about. Yeah, I just uh, my my only question was like uh, for for those uh, for those bay I leave five to seven beans on it, and like um, for for a while, like for until until they're ready to harvest, like. Well, bay verde is a dry bean. Like you can eat some for snap, but it generally is used as a dry bean. So I would leave more. So it was just in the case of if if the the bean was more like a wax bean, a fresh eating bean, I would encourage people to to actually eat them. Yeah. Well, best of luck with your beans, uh, Samuel. It was really cool to learn a little bit more about your setup. Um, and thanks so much to Tegan for your insights. This was a really cool presentation. Um, and yeah, I, I hope to connect later and see how it all went for you. Um, whatever beans you're saving, whatever other seeds you're saving this year. It sounds like there's a lot that you're growing out for the program, which is really cool. But, yeah, thanks so much. Well, thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.